Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ophélie. I'm a zooarchaeologist who specializes in ancient DNA research. And today I'm going to take you through a crash course on bioarchaeology. Now, bioarchaeology is quite a broad term, but it is essentially the study of biological archaeological remains. And these can fall into a variety of categories. We have the usual suspects that are bones and teeth. We have collagenous tissues such as leather and parchments. We have keratinous tissues such as hair and feathers, calcified remains like mollusk shells and eggshells, other mineralized remains like coprolites, and plant remains. Now, because this crash course is primarily geared towards the Chicken Journal Club, I'm going to really focus on the material that allows us to explore different themes surrounding human-animal relationships through time. One of those themes that I want to begin with is the theme of domestication. Now, domestication represents a big event in human history. And the questions that we tend to ask around domestication is where, when, and how an animal was domesticated, how many times was it domesticated, but also from what wild populations is it descended from. Now, there are different ways in which you can domesticate an animal, and what this will essentially define the nature of your relationship with these animals throughout history. For instance, we have the commensal pathway. Now, this is uh, actually doesn't begin with the intention of domesticating an animal. Rather, as human societies change their environment, different populations of wild animals would have become attracted to certain elements of these new human niches, such as food waste. Vice versa, human societies would have found it quite beneficial to have these animals around. And you will begin to see a relationship blossom. This is what we think has happened for the dog, the cat, and the pigeons. Another pathway is the prey pathway. Now, contrary to the commensal pathway, this does actually involve human intention, but the motive is to increase the efficiency of resource management. And this eventually leads to humans having a complete control over an animal's diet and reproduction. This is what we think has happened for a lot of the farm animals, like um, cattle and sheep, but llamas as well, for instance. And finally, we have the directed pathway. Now, this begins with the direct intention of domesticating an animal, but these animals have usually been brought into human niches for reasons other than food, for instance, for transport and, uh, and generally, yeah, for transport, for instance. Uh, this is the case for horses and camels and dromedaries. Now, how do you actually find out or how do you investigate domestication in the archaeological records? Generally, what you would do is you would try to find out what is the earliest evidence of domestication that you have. So, for instance, when it comes to the bones, you will see that domestication affects uh, animals uh, morphologically. So, for instance, when you have a wild boar and a domestic pig, you will see that the domestic pig has a shortening of the snout. They have a brain reduction um, in size, and you will also see that their bones are generally a lot more gracile. So if you can find out, uh, if you find a very early bone that you think belongs to a domestic pig, then that might be your earliest evidence of domestication. Now, there are other ways in which you can try to at least point towards a certain human-animal relationship. And this is looked at in terms of the burial context. So if you have an animal that has been very carefully buried, then you know that this animal meant something to, the, to a human society. And there was already this kind of established relationship. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were domesticated, but you see this kind of attachment. Now, obviously, with the development of ancient DNA techniques, we can also use uh, ancient DNA to try to figure out where your sample falls on the phylogenetic tree. Is it closer to the domesticates or is it closer to the wild forms? Obviously, this is dependent as well on the level of preservation. Sometimes it won't fall into either plate or it will not be very explicit. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, and this is something that we've been wrestling with for a while, obviously. Now, um, when it comes to the chickens, what's the case of the chicken? So what was the wild ancestor of the chicken? Well, we know it was the jungle fowl, but there are four species of jungle fowl in South Southeast Asia. Therefore, back in 1996, armed with fragments of modern genomes, Fumihito and his colleagues showed that Gallus gallus domesticus, the domestic chicken, 
fell within uh, the Gallus Gallus clade. This means that the main wild ancestor of domestic chickens was the red jungle fowl, Gallus Gallus. Now, if we want to go even deeper, the problem with Gallus Gallus is that we have five subspecies of Gallus Gallus within South Southeast Asia. We have Gallus Gallus murgi, Gallus Gallus spedicius, Gallus Gallus tribuii, Gallus Gallus Gallus, and Gallus Gallus punctiva. So last year, Wang and his team sequenced 863 full genomes of modern species, subspecies, and domestic chicken populations to try to see if they could pinpoint which population had led rise to domestic chickens. And they showed that the domestic chickens grouped a lot closer to Gallus Gallus spedicius. Therefore, not only do we know it's a red jungle fowl, Gallus Gallus, we also know that it's Gallus Gallus spedicius. Now, this is not to say that Gallus Gallus spedicius is the only population that led right that gave rise to the domestic chickens. We actually know that there's been a lot of interbreeding between um, species and subspecies. So we have an idea of which one was the main wild ancestor, but we have to be aware of what other populations and species and subspecies may have contributed to the genetic makeup of our domestic chickens. Now, where was the chicken domesticated? Well, it can't have been anywhere else than within the uh, distribution of its wild ancestor. And therefore, because we know that it's Gallus Gallus spedicius, you can even close down or kind of pinpoint the region of domestication to where Gallus Gallus spedicius is. Now, this is useful, but you have to be aware that we are here basing ourselves on the modern distribution of Gallus Gallus spedicius. That might not have been the case back in the past. We do know that the range, uh, the geographical range of animals back in the past changed based on climatic events or anthropogenic changes. So you have to bear in mind that what you're basing yourself from is modern data, it might not be truly representative of what happened in the past. Finally, uh, we have when was the, was the chicken domesticated? Now, the molecular clock would say that there's been a split between Gallus, Gallus spedicius, and the domestic chicken about 9,500 plus or minus 3,300 years ago. But archaeologically, uh, the domestic chicken is seen a lot later. Now, is, what is this linked to? And actually, it's not surprising. We can see this in dogs as well. What you end up in having is you have to bear in mind that what your the earliest archaeological records might not actually be the earliest domesticates. It's only what you've been able to find. Chicken bones are very light and they don't preserve very well in the archaeological records. So there's always a bias towards whether or not you'll be able to find them. The second thing that you have to bear in mind is that you're only going to find bones where you dig. And this is entirely linked on funding as well, on the priorities that are given in different countries to archaeology. So the earliest chicken bones might not have actually been uncovered yet. Now, there are other ways that this is like basically domestication. This is one of the themes that we can explore, but there are also other themes that you can try to investigate through a bone assemblage. So if you have your bone assemblage, one of the first questions you're gonna ask is what bones are present? Are there long bones like tibiotarsus, tarsometatarsus, or is it the skull? You basically have to identify the different elements. Once you have the elements, then you can identify the species. What species are the bones that you have from? Usually you use comparative collections, uh, but you can also use manuals that will basically describe what are the different morphological changes between the different species. But obviously with the development of biomolecular archaeology, we also have other techniques like zooms, which is zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry and DNA. Those two techniques will also allow you to uh, identify a species provided preservation of proteins or DNA respectively are good. Once you have the species, then you can try to figure out if your bone is left or right. And this is important because based on this, you can tell how many individuals you had on the site. I'll give you an example. If you have, for instance, four right coracoids and two left coracoids, then you know that your minimum number of individual is four because there's only one right coracoid for every chicken. Therefore, if you have four right coracoids, you have four chickens. You can also investigate how old an individual is. And in archaeology, we have two different techniques. The first one is the epiphyseal fusion. Uh, 
So when uh, you're born, your the shaft of your bone isn't actually fused to its extremities. It will fuse as you grow older. Therefore, based on the species and whether or not the, the epiphysis, the distal ends are fused, fusing or unfused, you can try to figure out or you can retrace how old an individual was when it died. The other way that we can also identify age is by looking at tooth eruption and wear. And obviously the patterns of tooth eruption will differ based on, will, yeah, differ based on species. The tooth wear pattern is generally classified into broad categories. And by combining the different wear of the different teeth, as well as whether or not they have erupted, this will give you a general idea of how old an individual was. You can look at marks and pathologies, and I'll come back to this at the end when it comes to health. But for instance, here we have a right chicken femur uh, and the left, the, with the, let me see, on the left side, you end up in having a left chicken that has a fracture and it's kind of healed. Uh, but you can tell that it's been trauma there. Whereas on the right side, you have a chicken tibiotarsis from Princess Hay, and you can see at the very bottom, you have some like very thin uh, cut marks that's usually linked to when you want to basically cut your chicken for butchery, for eating. Vice versa, you can also look at different um, other ways, like other pathologies. So for instance, at the bottom, you have what's called a leaping effect, uh, and that's usually found in drought cattle. It's when, because the cattle have to carry a lot of weight, their phalanges need to basically expand to counter uh, the weight, um, extra weight that the animal has to carry or has to lift. And this is kind of what you see, this, um, this kind of out, outward shape of bone that's growing, um, which helps you, say, helps you tell you what the animals were actually used for. And finally, you can look at sex. Now in human skeletons, you would use the skull and the pelvis. But in, in animals, it's a bit more complicated. There are some pointers that will allow you to help to identify the sex of an individual. In chickens, for instance, uh, laying hens will have this kind of medullary bone, it's called, inside the bone shaft. It's this kind of very fluffy texture, if you can see. Uh, and this is made, this is done as they're creating their eggs. So you know that if you find a bone that has medullary bone inside, you know it's a hen and you know it was laying eggs as well. Now, based on all this information, you can explore a variety of themes. You can explore, for instance, um, oh yes, and I forgot with sex as well, you can also use DNA nowadays. Now, one of the main themes you can um, explore as well is subsistence and diet. So if you have a herd that's been primarily raised for meat, then you will find a lot of the long bones, um, long bone fragments within your assemblage. Um, but you will also see a lot of cut marks or butchery marks. Um, and they are also, look, if you also look at the profile of your herd, that might give indications about what they were used for. For instance, for meat, you would kill a lot of animals as they reach a meat optimum, let's say. So you would see that they would be killed around three to four years, for instance. But if you are keeping a herd for milk, then you'll end up in having a lot of uh, young ones being killed because you want to get the milk as well. You won't kill all of them because obviously you want your herd to keep breeding as well, but there'll be a high percentage of infants. Now, there are also other ways in which you can identify subsistence and diet, for instance, stable isotope analysis. Now, for the ratios of carbon and nitrogen isotopes can inform the type of diet of an individual. For instance, carbon isotopes can be used to distinguish between C3 plants, which make up a majority of the land plants, and C4 plants, which include maize. Carbon isotopes can also be used to distinguish terrestrial from marine food. Nitrogen isotopes, on the contrary, will increase the higher the individual is on the food chain, and that can therefore give you an indication of the amount of animal product that is included in the diet. So let me give you an example. Here we have a study um, that's looked at Roman to late medieval chickens versus uh, modern broilers. And what you end up in seeing is that uh, there is basically the diet of the broiler chicken becomes more grain-based, especially for instance with C4 plants, as it's being developed in the 1950s. Uh, and therefore you see that, for instance, in terms of the broilers, uh, approximately 60% of them, uh, of the broiler feed is composed of cereals such as maize, wheat, uh, and barley. 
And then uh, you have also a lipid residue analysis. Now, lipids is, are collectively known as fats, uh, wax raisins of the natural world. And they will have a particular signature which will allow you to tell what kind of animal was being, was actually, the, 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 does this signature belong to? And lipid residue analysis have been used a lot in pots, in cooking pots, to try to figure out what people were cooking in them. So that's about, that's kind of what we can investigate uh, through in terms of diet subsistence and diet. And I'd like to just give you a very quick case study in terms of Roman chickens. Uh, this is based on a study done by colleagues, including Mark Malby and Julia Best. They looked at the military amphitheater at Chester in Cheshire. And what they found is they found a variety of eggshells. And they see that they have two phases. They have AD 70 to 80, where you have the first phase of the amphitheater, and AD 100, where you have a lot of eggshells underneath the sitting banks. Now they've done a zooms analysis and they figured out that all the eggshells were actually belonging to chickens. But then what my colleague Julia Best also did is that she looked at the microscopy to identify the stage of development of the chicken within these eggs. And what she found is that 90% of the fragments uh, associated to the AD100 context actually were either freshly laid had been halted early in their incubation period or infertile. And what they figured out is what you basically had was the snack foods of Roman times, such as, for instance, we have popcorns when we watch a show at the cinema, and those Romans would have eaten uh, fresh eggs as they watched the show in the amphitheater, which I found a pretty cool study. Now, other themes that you can explore is secondary product. So again, if you look at your herd uh, mortality, your different profiles, you will see that for wool, you keep a lot of your individuals because you want the wool as much as possible and the, until they get too old and that is when you actually kill them. So that is another kind of way of figuring out what a herd was used for. When it comes to leather and parchment and hides, uh, obviously, you have the products that you find in the museums. If they've been very well preserved, you will see that hide has been used. You can tell the species based on ancient DNA, but you can also tell whether or not there's been tanning sites based on the bones. If that's the case, then you'll end up in having an assemblage, which has primarily a lot of extremities as well as the skull. And these are um, examples of the marks that have been done on the bones to try to get to the hide. It's from assemblage uh, in medieval France that I studied a few years ago. And it's essentially what we think is characteristic of a tanning site. Now, finally, let's look at health as a theme. And as I mentioned before, we have, we can look at trauma on particular chickens. So if you have a bone where that has been subjected to an injury but has healed, then you know that the individual was most likely cared for, or at least that it was strong enough to be able to recover. But what I want to draw your attention on is the question of what are you actually seeing in a cemetery? So if we think more about in terms of human cemeteries here, you have individuals that are buried because they have died of a natural cause or old age but some people have died because of a disease. Now, what you need to remember is that not all diseases affect the skeleton. So some people who would appear very healthy were actually ill, but you wouldn't actually know about this. The other question, which for me is a real food for thought is some diseases can kill their host before their skeleton is affected. Therefore, are, you, are the individuals with skeletal marks actually healthier than those without? Because they would have survived up to the point where the disease has affected their skeleton. So in a way, doesn't that make them healthier than the individuals that have been killed by this disease before it affected their skeleton? I find it quite an interesting question um, and something to bear in mind when you study archaeological assemblages from cemeteries. And I want to finish with a case study um, which links bones as well as uh, ancient DNA. This is an example of some of a tuberculosis legions that have been observed on the skeletal remains of a population in Peru, which was, they, they basically predate the European introduction, the European arrival in the Americas. Now, what's interesting is if you look at tuberculosis in America today, you will see that it is very closely related to European strains of tuberculosis. 
So the fact that you can find tuberculosis in individuals before the arrival of the Europeans was very surprising because you thought we thought uh, that um, the Europeans had brought tuberculosis along with them. So what Boss and colleagues have done is that they have sequenced the genome of the tuberculosis and they found out that it was much more closely related to, um, or at least it grouped very closely to M. pinipedi, which is a kind of seal. So interestingly, their conclusion was that the seals must have picked it up, uh, most probably, I think, in South Africa, and then they came all the way to uh, the Peruvian coast. And because those human societies were exploiting seals as a marine resource, they ended up in catching tuberculosis themselves. And there you have an introduction of a disease in another continent. So I found this example, really, this case study very interesting when it comes to grouping different um, methods in order to try to understand better the development, development of human animal relationships, in this case, uh, health through time as well. And uh, that's it. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. There is a talk by Professor Richard Thomas on the Chicken Journal Club YouTube channel, which goes a bit more in depth in terms of chickens and archaeology. And so if you're interested, please do give it a watch. It's re I really enjoyed it. And yeah, thank you so much for your attention. I will take any questions.